On September 11, 2001, the United States was attacked by terrorists. In New York, the focus of the attack was the World Trade Center. Many in the city sought to contribute to the healing process. Michael Felchew created a community-based photo project, inviting ordinary citizens to share their experiences of September 11. Hundreds of people provided thousands of photographs taken in the moments, days, and weeks following the attacks. The collection is called the September 11 Photo Project. The stories you will hear are from photo project contributors and others who were caught on film or caught up in events as they photographed that unforgettable day. To me, the real beginning of the story is the day before, because I feel that I knew something was going to happen. The company that I work for occupied the 31st, 32nd, and 34th floors of Two World Trade. On the afternoon of September the 10th, there was a really violent thunderstorm that came from the south. It was kind of slow in the office, so I went to one of the conference rooms and photographed it not really knowing why, just kind of wanting to capture the way that the storm had advanced and the feeling that, I, that it gave me. My husband's name is Mark Rasweiler. He was the vice president for Marsha McLennan um, in New York City. Uh, he worked at the World Trade Center in the North Tower on the 100th floor. Mark, uh, would leave early, typically by 6 o'clock, 6.15, and the routine was he would just call me to wake me up as he was heading out the door, and um, just said he was leaving and have a good day, and off he went. All news, all the time. This is 1010 Winds. Good morning. 64 degrees at 8 o'clock. It's Tuesday, September 11th. I'm Lee Harris. Here's what's happening. Today. It's sunshine throughout. It's really a splendid September day. The afternoon it temperature about 80 day. degrees. Polls Great are weather open. for the Lots of primary races election. to be decided, including Tonight, who will run for mayor of New York. Suburbs tomorrow is sunny and very nice. High 78. As I woke up that morning, I looked towards the World Trade Center and said, oh, we have a conference today at the Windows in the World, and I have to be there early. And uh, as I arrived at the World Trade Center, uh, I spotted something on the step in the corner. I wasn't sure what it was. Lo and behold, it was a small bird looking forlorn and doomed. I picked it up and I, I put it into a, uh, an evergreen, which was at the bottom of the stairs. That morning, I, I usually wake up around lunchtime. But that morning was very strange. I woke up around 7 a.m. I don't know why. I'd only been asleep for about four hours. I went to the window. It was a beautiful day, beautiful blue sky day. I was the happiest I've ever been in my life. I just felt very calm, very peaceful. I had a really bad night. I, I didn't sleep. I had bad dreams. And when I woke up on the morning of the 11th, all of that was really fresh in my mind, and I, pretty much every part of me did not want to go to work that day, but I forced myself, and I, and I did. As I went up in the elevator, I started thinking about the bird again, and um, I just felt, you know, I thought, you know, I should have moved the bird to a, a nicer location. I arrived at the Windows on the World, 106th floor. The first thing I noticed was that uh, the work I had intended to do that morning had already been taken care of saw one of my colleagues, and he said he'd been there since 7 o'clock. It was his event. He wanted to make sure everything was right. But then we both realized there were a couple things missing, and uh, so I immediately said, oh, I'll go back to the office and get them. So I headed down, and, uh, and now I was going to rescue my bird and take it over to uh, someplace safer. I basically went through the routine that I normally do, and it was actually while I was checking my email. I felt a huge vibration that shook the building, and the lights flickered on and off. And I immediately sat up, and I said, oh my god, that was a bomb. And then I thought, 
There's no way that was a bomb, because that came from above. This just into our newsroom, a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. Apparently a direct hit into one of the Twin Towers. The apartment that I was staying at at the time was two blocks below the World Trade Center. The first thing I, I remember hearing was a loud explosion. But the thing that really caught my attention was hearing windows shattering and hearing debris falling. Ran over to the window to see what was going on, and I couldn't believe my eyes. I mean, the whole sky was filled with smoke, and there was millions of sheets of office paper floating in the air, and there was debris landing down on the street below. I had no idea the size or scope of what had just happened. I walked to the south windows of our office, and I stood there watching. You know, I, I just came from there. I was just there, and you know, I couldn't believe you know, that I just missed this by you know, five minutes, 10 minutes at the very most. And I remember uh, yelling to one of the other editors to please try to call these people, see if they're OK. One of the people at the World Trade Center was reached. He said that everyone had been knocked to the ground and uh, that they were all shaken up. He said, but we're all OK, and they're going to evacuate us. It's kind of smoky, but we're all OK. I knew as a, with my background in nursing that I could be of help. So I grabbed my roller blades, had my medical kit on my back, and I had my camera, and just headed, headed down there. I had heard over one of our radio systems that we use that uh, Manhattan transmitted a third alarm for a plane that struck the World Trade Center. I heard some chatter on the radio about a plane into the building, and, and then I heard Mike come on confirming the job. And uh, I just kind of turned around, got my gear, and headed to Michael's house. Once I started to smell smoke, I just went into a, I don't even know how to explain it, but a, a survival mode. And as we were all queuing up to go down the stairs, uh, I realized that I was last online. I thought, oh my god, you know, I have to go down 31 flights of stairs in this panic state. And just as I was thinking that, an elevator opened. It was against my better judgment. I got on. One of my coworkers came running out of her office, yelling and screaming. So we went in and we put a TV on in somebody else's office. And I said, I have to call my mom. I said, my dad doesn't go every day. I just want to make sure he didn't go in today. And about 10 of 9, Karen called me to tell me that the towers had been hit. And at that time, I didn't really, excuse me. I really didn't think there was a need to worry. Never in my wildest dreams could have imagined what was about to take place. When I came off the elevator, I had a choice. I could go left or right. It was literally a, a choice between light and dark. The Liberty Street exit was the light because you know, the sun was coming through, and the concourse just looked dark and, and scary to me, and I just couldn't go back underground. I had to go out. I had to get out of here. We turned the TV on, and I see the World Trade Center burning. And then the announcement was that a plane had crashed into it. When I saw it, I just, I just knew that there was a lot of people dead already and a lot of people dying as I'm watching that. A lot of people need help. I called up our dispatcher and told him I was there at the 93 bombing. I was in charge of the evacuation. You know, if you need me, send me. I got onto Liberty Street. Debris was still falling, and then I started seeing pieces of the airplane. The second I got to the street, I turned around and looked back at the building and noticed that it wasn't debris that was falling. It was actually people jumping out of the building. The sight was almost enough to make me drop to my knees. It, it was like adrenaline just pumped through my body at that moment because I couldn't believe uh, that what I was seeing in front of me was real. And I realized at that point that I had to just get out of there, that I had to save myself, and there was really no one for me to help um, because this was something way out of my league. So I went into uh, one of my co-workers' offices who had a radio, and she turned on the radio, and um, at that point, that's when the second tower was hit. 
just as I started to cross the street, I heard a noise. And I knew exactly what it was. I knew it was a plane. And I knew that it was coming. And it got louder and louder to the point where it sounded like it was right on top of us. And it definitely sounded like he was full throttle. I mean, it, it was moving so unbelievably fast. And I just, I just prayed to God at that point, and I said, you know, please, uh, please don't let this happen. And uh, the last thing I saw before the second attack was the silver underside of the plane before it went into the building. It was just uh, unbelievable, the explosion. I mean, I could feel the heat from where I was standing. It was just a, a massive, massive fireball. I know it looked big on TV, but to be standing there below the towers and see that, it was just unbelievable. And it was a uh, complete pandemonium at that point. Everyone was running. It was like a stampede, and I just remember thinking, I have to get, I have to get as far away from this area as I can. I knew this disaster was unfolding, but I just had this outside hope that, that everyone was going to be okay. We started getting reports that there was a third plane inbound. We got reports that uh, a plane crashed into the Pentagon. The world that we were under attack, that this was war. It is horrific. A second plane the size of a passenger jet flying into the second tower of the, of the World Trade Center. Oh, my God. I think the moment that second plane hit, I was pretty much terrified. I, I distinctly remember that feeling of my heart feeling like it was going to come out of my chest. It was beating so hard. I was trying to remain calm, but I knew that I was in trouble. I thought of my dad immediately. I just felt this hopelessness, like, oh, right away, like, oh my gosh, something happened to him. I knew based on the time frame that he left around 6.15 that he should have been in his office, but again, I didn't know if he had a meeting first thing in the morning or maybe stopped at the Midtown office. I was standing at the base of Bank One Plaza. There was a ramp that led down to a loading dock. People that were caught out in the plaza at the World Trade Center that were exiting the buildings started running down the ramp towards me. I just remember the look of panic on some of their faces. I mean, they were absolutely terrified. Their momentum carried them right into the metal door of the loading dock, and they began pounding on it, begging someone to open it. At that point, I started feeling panicked, like, OK, something bad could happen here, and I knew I had to get out of there. I called the dispatcher again. Whatever alarm assignment you have down there, double it, because now we have two buildings fully involved. And uh, then it was not really asking to go down. I kind of told him, I'm going. We exited the Holland Tunnel. The first thing we saw was the two towers burning. You just heard nothing but sirens and people yelling and screaming. And I went to the back of Mike's truck. I grabbed my camera, I grabbed my radio, took a deep breath and said, this is what we got to do, and started walking down West Broadway. I had to stop in to see a friend to get some batteries. And all I remember him saying is being really angry at me for going down there and trying to stop me. And he said, it's not like you're going off to a war or something. And those words have stayed in my head to this day because he was so wrong. Myself and Chief Peter Talamo were ordered to report to Seven World Trade Center because the Mayor's Office of Emergency Ma Management was being activated. Based on the proximity of Seven World Trade Center to the actual World Trade Center towers, I was a little apprehensive about going down there in the first place. I ran into the North Tower. Pete Hayden, who was the deputy chief, was there. He was set up at the command post. I went up to him. I said, Pete, what do you need? 
and he told me that uh, they had reports of people trapped on the 21st and 25th floor. I grabbed one of the companies from the staging area. You guys ready to go? You have your extra tools, extra cylinders for the mask? They had everything. I said, let's go. I got out onto Greenwich Street and ran into my apartment building. Got up to the seventh floor and saw that my roommates were just all huddled together. Developments coming fast and furious this morning. A late word out of Washington from a source in the nation's capital. The White House has been threatened with a terrorist attack. Uh, also, all airports nationwide shut down. I gathered a couple things and threw them in my backpack, and uh, we headed out to the street. The whole scene itself was unbelievable. You, you couldn't really describe it. It seemed almost like a, something that was shot out of a movie, something that wasn't real. I was directed by one of our supervisors to keep the pedestrians out of the street as they're, they're looking up towards the World Trade Center. You had to get their attention and tell them to stay on the sidewalk, keep the area clear. At that point, the firemen were coming. I remember turning around and watching them go, and I just remember thinking, there was no way I could do that. And, and I wouldn't even know where to begin. We took the elevator up to the 16th floor and then went to the, the stairwell, to the C stairwell, and started working our way up to the 21st floor. There were people still coming down um, nonstop. When we entered Seven World Trade Center, the lower lobby was pretty deserted. Seven World Trade Center was being evacuated, so we were basically in a holding pattern in the lower lobby. We got to the block just north of the North Tower. At that time, we heard a cracking noise, and nobody knew what it was. So we kept walking a little bit further, and then we heard the cracking noise again, we got to the 21st floor, the 25th floor, the two assignments we had. There were firemen already helping the people who needed help there. So uh, I just started going, working my way further up. I stopped into a deli on uh, Greenwich Street and grabbed something to drink. When I walked outside of the deli, um, I just looked to my left. I felt an actual pressure drop in the lobby. And although we're talking about seconds here. It seemed like time had stopped for those few seconds. There was almost like a, a quietness, and, and there was such peace. And I yelled over to Chief Talamo, who was standing by the window looking up at the tower, Chief, get back here. And this incredible noise started so loud and so overpowering, everyone froze. And when I looked up, I saw the building that I was just in collapse. I could feel my body compressing. I screamed out to the chief, this is the big one and I turned my back towards the street. We would wait in any second for the ceiling to just explode, because that's what sounded like something was, was coming. I could feel an explosion in the lobby, and I was thrown up against the wall I was, I was standing next to. It was unbelievable. The sound was just, you know, it was just thunderous. We didn't hear sirens. We didn't hear screams. It took 10 seconds for that building to collapse. And then you looked 
looked up and all of a sudden this huge gigantic cloud that was full of smoke and debris started to hit me and I turned and I started to run. I had only gotten about 20 feet when I was just overtaken by all the debris that was raining down on us. That's when I heard a loud whoosh. I could see that there was almost like an avalanche of ash coming down the street. The debris just raced down every street to the river like, like a bullet. It was only the grace of God in that I, I just heard a small, still voice. It said, under the car. And I dove underneath the parked cars that, that were on the street. And then all of a sudden it stopped and there was silence in that lobby. And I opened my eyes and it's totally black. I don't think it, it was a matter of being scared. It was just a matter of thinking to myself that this may be the end of my life. The whole entire tower had just come down. And such blackness had materialized and there was such an intensity of heat. Uh, I, I got the impression that the, the vehicle that I was underneath was going to just burst into flames. A couple of people ran into the back of the deli trying to get out the back door. When they opened the back door, all the ash came in. So I knew we were completely surrounded. And I really, really thought that we were going to suffocate. Your eyes were burning, your nose was burning, your throat was burning. And I, I started to think of my loved ones and I said, I, I can't believe I'm going to die like this underneath a car. I got on the radio and tried to find out what was going on. Does anyone know what happened? You heard someone say the tower came down. I was in the North Tower, the whole North Tower didn't come down, so it had to be the South Tower. I immediately knew that there were hundreds of firemen in there that just died. Uh, All units, stand by for this transmission. We got six World Trade, seven World Trade, and the North Tower, we got reports of officers trapped. The entire lobby of Seven World Trade Center was destroyed. It was as if I was locked in a closet with absolutely no light. I probably could have laid down there and suffocated and maybe died there, but I had a will to survive. I had to find that one door that uh, hopefully would lead uh, to safety. All right, Temple, we have multiple units on the way in at this time, Kate. Temple. Okay. You're getting nothing but mayday calls on the radio. Where I'm trapped here, I'm trapped there. I remember being here, and that's where I think I am now. Come get me. Now anything's possible. So we knew that if the first tower can collapse, the second tower is just a matter of time. But the brain surgeons we are, we just, we just stayed where we were. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't leave. We, we just stayed and helped. Without anyone else to take command, I gave the order to evacuate the North Tower. Drop your tools, drop your masks, we're getting out. I did have an intimate knowledge of possibly the one escape route in that lower lobby. I started moving uh, in pitch blackness towards what I thought was that area. At a certain point, some light was filtering through, and the light was the door that led to the loading dock. When I got to the door, the bag that I thought I was dragging was actually a person. It's one of the things I can't explain. I thought that I had a bag in my hand. I thought I had the giant hazardous materials duffel. All of a sudden, Chief Talamo appears, and he's dragging someone that's injured. He brought his injured through the door. I brought my injured through the door. 
and we made it into that area, that area of safety. It was just a thick, thick blizzard of snow. You couldn't see a few feet in front of you, and I just started heading towards the World Trade Center, and everyone was coming out, and it was chaos everywhere. People walking in the streets, people had gashes out of their head and blood coming down their faces. We left Seven World Trade Center and went up to Sheriff Mathis's office. He couldn't believe the condition we were in. I was physically hurting because I was having a really difficult time breathing. I was having a difficult time seeing. I was in a state of shock. I got to the approach of the Brooklyn Bridge and that's when I ran into an in-law of mine and I was just really traumatized and he saw me in the crowd and he said, you know, just come with me and we're just gonna walk um, as far as we can. The kids were saying, which tower is Daddy in? And I just could remember that he was in the tower with the um, antenna on it, and I kept saying, well, he's OK, he's OK. I waited till the stairwells cleared above me. And so then I started going down. I went down the B stairwell. I was relieved. I was originally on the 30th floor, the 20s, the teens. Now I'm in the single digits. Now we're going to be out of here in a couple minutes. The crowds of individuals who had been in the buildings adjacent to the World Trade Center had started to come out. And I kept telling them, move back. You got to keep moving back. All of a sudden, you just heard an earth-shattering explosion. an indescribable noise. I tried to run. I got one or two steps, and then something hit me, knocked me down, and then the floor gave out from underneath me, and I fell. At this point, you really didn't know which way to run, so we ran in the direction that our bodies were pretty much pointing. You didn't know really what the collapse zone was, so there was always a fear of, you know, how far away is far enough. Everyone just ran and dived under cars and just prayed. I just prayed. No, Lord, not again. Not again. The debris just seemed to engulf us and trap us, and individuals were screaming, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Take your shirt, breathe through a shirt, breathe through a handkerchief. You're going to make this. You're going to be all right. You're going to make it. There was a million thoughts going through my mind. Is this going to be my last thought? Is it going to be over now? Is it going to be over a second from now? When is it going to be over? I just didn't want to suffer. I wanted it to be quick. We saw a bagel store. We dove into that. You know, that's when the debris all started hitting the windows and, you know, just enveloped us in darkness. We were watching live TV coverage. The TV just blacked out, and I thought, this is it. This is it. The South Tower took 10 seconds to collapse. The North Tower took eight. I was in that North Tower. It was dark, it was black. And I thought, well, I guess I'm dead. You know, this is what it must be like to be dead. Your, your thought process continues, but you're dead. So I said, ah, not bad. And then a couple seconds later, I says, nah, I don't think I'm dead. Because then I, I start feeling my body. Miraculously, this small little area of the one stairway, everything collapsed around it. So I, I called out, is anyone else here? And uh, after a couple seconds, I got a response. Yeah, I'm here. Another one, I'm here too. You can hear the screaming from outside the bagel store. I made my way to the door, opened the door, and just started yelling and screaming, if you can hear my voice, come to my voice, we have shelter. I got a response of, you know, we can't move, we need help. And I proceeded to go out into the darkness, into the debris, to just grab as many people as I can. Everybody that he pulled off the street, I had a line of them 
going into the back and I was hosing them off. This guy needed water, he was covered in soot. I washed him off. Does he need medical aid? No? Okay, let's go to the next guy. Finally, uh, the debris had stopped and uh, I asked everybody who was with me in the crowd, were they all right? And they said, yeah, we're fine. Got up and started walking back towards the World Trade and it just it was just so thick and you couldn't see anybody and they were pushing everybody north and the police were like, go back, go back. They made us leave the area and we ended up at Stuyvesant School. A guy got on the payphone and called 911. And I remember thinking to myself, that was like such an absurd thing to do. But uh, within a few minutes of that call, uh, I'd say between five and seven of uh, New York Fire Department came in, came to the back, opened the door and said, you know, you guys have to evacuate. Watching these towers fall, I was absolutely in disbelief. I mean, we were sitting on our rooftop and literally the entire city cried, no, no, no. I mean, echoed through the city. This nervous energy took over and I, I have to work. What do I do? What do I do? I couldn't just, I couldn't sit there. I hopped on my bike and pedaled as fast as I could to the scene. It seemed like forever of waiting and waiting around. And everyone was frustrated because we thought there were thousands and thousands of bodies waiting alive. And we just wanted to get in there, but they wouldn't. They stopped us and they only would let firemen in. And, and we said, well, who's going to help the firemen? I just knew that as a firefighter that we had our hands full. Uh, it was total devastation. It's the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. I had asked for Chief Downey and they said he's missing. I asked for Chief Palolo, he's missing. Chief Moran, Chief Casper, they were, they were all gone. I was calling for help on one handy talkie. I was going through all the channels, giving May days. I felt I was alive in this void, but there's a hundred floors of rubble above me, and there's no way anyone's ever going to get to us. It was over an hour and a half to two hours before I actually raised someone, and I raised another chief who I know. I was telling him, Mark, we're in the building, we're in the, B, uh, the North Tower, the B stairway. They couldn't get into us. The waiting, the initial waiting period, was very difficult. An hour would go by and it felt like an eternity. I mean, we were just, we had all of the phones and you know, the cell phones and, and the portable phone, we had them all outside on the table and we were just sitting there waiting for my father to call or to, or to come home. Inside, outside, the phone would ring, the TV was on. There really wasn't anything anyone could do. So it was really just a matter of sitting and waiting. Arriving at ground zero, there was a, a silence, uh, very much like a snowstorm, a muffle. But through the muffle, you could hear beeps, beeping sound just everywhere, surrounded, sort of little alarms. Apparently, firemen have a sort of sensor, a beeping sensor, so the surrounding beeping, I think, were the trapped firemen and the wreckage. After a while, I started noticing a light, a very dim light above us. I actually thought I was hallucinating. And I asked anyone else, did anyone else see this light? And other people saw it too. After a little while longer, I'm looking at it, I said, I gotta go see what that light is. And then I climbed up to the light. I climbed out, it was a hole, and I got out, and then all of a sudden I'm on top of this big pile of debris. And I could see the rubble field. I could see buildings on fire. I could see the devastation. What I didn't see is any people, no one. A group of firemen passed in front of me and one sort of broke from the group. He just inched his way into the wreckage. He knows who's underneath the wreckage, he knows.
I stayed with one firefighter who I'm very close with, Tommy Burke, and we proceeded to look for the command post. Tommy came across a knee pad. So we started to dig and dig. Tommy reached down and said, I grabbed a leg. This person was underneath like a big eye beam so we went from four or five people to probably 50 people and everybody's trying to help. And it wound up being our chief of department, Peter Gansey. We put him in a body bag. We um, gave a moment of silence. We gave a hand salute. And then we just proceeded to continue digging. When guys from 43, when they finally came, they were exhausted. They'd been trying to get into us for hours. I used a rope, tied it to myself, and stretched the rope down, tying it off at spots so other guys could follow. We went one at a time. I, I found a few other chiefs. I told them that there's guys in there. There's still guys trapped. And after I was, I was sure that there was help on the way, uh, guys threw me in an ambulance and took me off to St. Vincent's. I met this EMS guy, he'd driven over in the morning, Michael, and he had big medical packs and oxygen packs on his back. He was, he was amazing, and he said, come with me. Allison and I, we became a team. Better than standing around doing nothing. You know, we had the determination. We could see that in each other's eyes. Uh, we needed to do something. So we just filled our backpacks with things, and, and we just said, we're going in. We grabbed extra water and everything. We brought it outside and we started handing it out to people. We started washing people off. We would wash somebody off. We go put out a fire. We go hump hose. We go take pictures. We go wash more people off. Looked up the West Side Highway and you just saw transit buses of firefighters coming in. They had their help there. We didn't want to get in their way. That's when we just kind of backed off. We took some more photos and then we left. We made our way to Firehouse 10 and uh, we started a little triage there that night, Tuesday night. And I didn't keep thinking about the big, big picture. I just kept thinking about, let's get through this. Let's get these guys. There's like about 50 guys in a line and we had all these saline bags washing their eyes. But then the line never stopped. They just kept coming and coming. Me and about three or four of firefighters that I work with worked our way into the Vista Hotel to try to see if there's any firefighters in there. Upon entering there, we found a search rope. It ended in a void. A void is just uh, a collapsed area. Going into the voids as rapidly as we can, uh, calling for body bags and, and putting people in these bags. And I, I can't really describe it. You almost wished that you weren't down there doing that. But you had to do it because it was our job and people needed to know they were getting respect and they were getting buried at home. I don't consider myself a New Yorker or an American at all. I was born in South America and I lived for a very long time in Europe. But by being in New York that day, you were touched by what happened in a very different way from anybody else who was anywhere else in the world. I decided to go to Tribeca to see if I could help. At about five o'clock in the afternoon, I arrived to Ground Zero. When I arrived there, I couldn't really believe my eyes. It looked much worse than it did on TV. We were stopping for maybe every hour or so, maybe until two or three in the morning, getting our eyes washed out. People were walking around in the collapsed area, handing out water to us. It was, it was unbelievable the amount of, of volunteers and help we had there. I tried to see what I could do to help all these people who were actually working there. I started uh, taking bottles of water to different parts 
of the site where the firefighters were working. People wouldn't really talk very much. And in some moments, whenever they thought they would have found somebody under the rubble, there would be total silence for a few minutes because they were trying to hear something from under the rubble. That silence is something I remember more than the noise there. About three o'clock in the morning, uh, my company all met and we all discussed what we were going to do, where we were going to sleep, and try to get a couple hours sleep. One firefighter and I, Tommy Burke, proceeded on this boat, which was damaged from the collapse. We took long showers to clean out our eyes and took like about an hour nap and then went back to work. I was there until about midnight, and by that time, I believe it was about to start raining, they were changing the shifts of the firefighters and rescue workers. And at that time, I decided to leave after a long day. When I woke up that next morning with my mom and just watching the sun come up, it was just this sinking feeling, just this hopeless sinking feeling in your stomach. I had called up my office to tell them that we hadn't heard from my father yet. And they said, you know, if there's anything we can do, let us know, you know, we'll do whatever we can. I said, actually, if you could scan in my father's photograph, we want to look for him. Our art department set up this whole flyer in less than an hour, and we were had it copied and we were off. I remember the next morning trying to go to work. By now I knew, you know, 71 people who were attending our conference had died, and 16 of my workmates had died, and and uh, and I had survived. I was, you know, I was the only one who who was there that morning who got out. We walked and we walked and we walked, hanging our flyers, going to hospitals, going anywhere and everywhere that we thought would be beneficial to find him. We stayed in the city till about 2, 3 in the morning, came home, slept for about an hour, and went back into the city again. We found a little restaurant which was half a block away from the remaining facade of the South Tower. Set up the IV bottles, set up stations for irrigating the people, set up the food area, set up a psychological counseling area. The firemen, they just lost all of their friends and we all sat down in candlelight and they started singing Danny Boy and patriotic songs and everyone was just crying. They just raised their drinks and toasted for all those who were left behind. I just know we were so taxed with the area we were working in. We were finding people, we were finding fire trucks, police cars, ambulances. We were looking for anybody. We were looking for a big void, everybody was hoping to just find that big void and just let the people out. I remember on the third day, I think it was, we get here tapping underground. At first they thought it was the generator pumps, but it wasn't because they were doing SOS codes and they could hear people tapping back. They worked on that spot for like four or five hours, but they couldn't get to anyone. It was 50, 100 feet of concrete. We just kept searching and searching. We were trying to remember what we searched the day before. But it was so big 
that I didn't really leave the West Side Highway for days. After the fifth day, after a routine was set, uh, we were asked to close down. We walked around to where we started, and Allison and I then said goodbye. I rolled right up the West Side Highway, and there were thousands of people just cheering and yelling. And <sighs> everyone was just trying to help. Everyone, even if you couldn't do anything, these people were waiting there for days and days. They knew they couldn't get in, they couldn't do anything, but they held up these big signs and they just said, thank you, heroes. And and they were just cheering and yelling, and then I just, just left, and I just went home. Sunday afternoon, Mark's company set up a crisis center in Midtown. They provided us with um, diagrams of the World Trade Center, the floors where they believed the impact of the planes hit. And at that point, um, I think, my children and I knew that um, there was no hope. I felt lost. I felt lost. I spent a lot of time trying to reconnect to the things that were really important to me. And it helped me calm myself and helped me put pieces back together. We had the first missing flyers. If it helped bring some hope to other families, then and I'm glad it was able to help. I think the posters stayed on the wall so long because it, it became a, a memorial, and I think people didn't want to take those pictures down. They, they didn't want to forget. I was angry. I was sad. I, I went through a roller coaster of emotions, and, and all at a very intense level. I, I was happy. I was happy to be alive. I guess one of the hardest things for me was, after a while, it became clear that all the families had come and gone, and, and in some cases, there were still desks filled with people's personal belongings. But someday, those desks are going to be filled again, and and uh, and then we. We just carry on, you know, we, uh, it's over, you know. Just before Christmas, a neighbor who was also a police officer stopped by the house to let me know that um, they made a positive identification. I had to have a funeral director go into the city to pick up the remains, and um, I asked him to be honest with me and tell me exactly what it was that they did find and um, it was simply a bone. So we, it pretty much confirmed what we had suspected, that um, Mark was killed instantly, and um, that I guess we were one of the lucky ones to at least have some form of closure. There are days that um, I don't think I'll be able to get through the day, but then there are times when I just hold on to the memories and the joy he brought into our lives. The September 11 Photo Project is a collection of more than 5,000 photographs and writings in response to the terrorist attacks. After opening in a New York gallery, the project began a national tour, and a selection of the photographs was published in a book.